there and uh, I want to give you guys a little exposition of how this seminar came to be. Uh, I actually was listening to a podcast called The Splendid Table a number of years ago and Andy was doing uh, an interview with Francis Lamb and it just really inspired me. Um, you were talking about an inclusive dining experience and touched on things that you know I always felt were kind of right and I, I didn't really know how to put into words uh, or put into action and I was super inspired by it. Uh, I've gone back to it dozens of times just when I'm thinking about how to make things more inclusive, um, how to welcome a greater majority uh, to the table. And I, I've shared it widely actually on Facebook every every few years. Uh, I, I always find it to be inspirational. So kind of sent me down a rabbit hole uh, Googling you. I kind of cyber stalked you for a minute. Uh, so learned about you uh, with some TED Talks, uh, Washington Post article, uh, one in particular uh, about Maybe three or four years ago in Philadelphia, um, two black men were uh, had the cops called on them uh, in a Starbucks uh, for loitering, even though they had been patrons, uh, and it caused uh, a huge debate on on race and racism, uh, and just kind of the the optics and perception of, you know, if, if white people had been loitering after that they had had their coffee, would they have been called on? And Washington Post had a great article where they said that you would have been a great voice, uh, kind of in this anti-racism training, uh, and it made me think of this uh, when we had the opportunity to pivot uh, during COVID to do virtual events, that maybe this is an important time to kind of bring your voice uh, kind of to the forefront. So I've always thought of you as being really inspiring um, and, and not uh, super preachy, just in terms of you do what has worked for you uh, and you lead by example. And I, I just thought that was super inspiring. So a little short bio, because Andy's actually going to talk about it himself, uh, but he's again DC based. He runs a cohort of restaurants called Busboys and Poets. Uh, he's been the recipient of many awards, uh, but some that have stuck out to me that are relevant to kind of our industry uh, being hospitality. Uh, you got employer of the year by the Employment Justice Center, which I think speaks volumes, uh, especially now uh, that we're talking about kind of how to reframe uh, the discussion and rebuild this industry. Um, I think that it was unsustainable for a really long time and for many reasons. And now with COVID taking this pause and getting the moment to rebuild, I think it's kind of a, a great time to look at uh, examples of what has worked in terms of uh, anti-racism, racial integration, and you've always been willing to go on record uh, to talk about these things, which I think a lot of restaurateurs shy away from um, for that reason that maybe they've not actually had a great blueprint or practice themselves. Um, so I think that you can set a really good example uh, for us all. So a little housekeeping, um, we're gonna be here for about an hour. Um, we formatted so that you will hear Andy's story. Uh, you'll hear some moderate, moderator questions uh, between us. And then we also got some crowdsource questions uh, from the internet. So we went on our social media and asked people uh, to submit questions ahead of time. So we've got about three of those. Uh, and then we wanna pivot it to active Q&A. So if you guys think of anything that you want to ask Andy, feel free to put it in the chat function in Zoom. Uh, we have a Skernik employee, Amanda, who will be watching over that, taking note, and then we can call on you uh, later in the final portion of our seminar. Uh, if you wish for any questions to be submitted anonymously, uh, feel free to private chat uh, Skernik virtual events. Uh, and any question that you put, just start it off with question for Andy, so we know that that's kind of the header for it. Uh, if you wish to revisit or share the seminar at a later time, uh, again, we're actually recording this, uh, so we will share the link with you uh, when the seminar is over and feel free to revisit that uh, and disseminate it amongst your peers if you so wish. Uh, and for those of you just joining us now, uh, welcome. We've got, again, uh, Andy Shalal from DC. Uh, and how race impacts the hospitality industry and why it matters uh, is the name of our seminar today. Um, I'm super happy to bring a fresh voice to the table, at least for most of us. Uh, and it's my pleasure to give the floor to Andy so we can get to know his journey and his best practices. Thank you so much. And thank you for taking uh, time out of your, I'm sure, a very busy day to uh, join this conversation, this very important conversation. Um, my name is Andy Shalal. I am uh, the owner and founder of Bus Boys and Poets, which is, as Krista said, a group of restaurants here in the Washington metropolitan area. Uh, we have seven locations and we're in the process of opening two more. We're kind of putting things a little bit on hold. Hopefully we'll get back to some sort of normal and get back to uh, our track. So um, I uh, came to Washington here via Baghdad, Iraq. So I'm, I'm an Iraqi originally. Uh, I came to this country uh, back in, in 1966. I was a small kid 
Uh, my uh, my parents moved here, and we um, we we basically settled here in Washington D.C. Two years after we arrived here in this country, uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated, and uh, I had nothing, uh, no knowledge about race in America at all. I had no idea what race even meant. Uh, I come from a country where it's more about class and social status and all of that, but race n just never played a role. Uh, and so I, I uh, was shocked and surprised, even as a small child, to be able to watch all the rioting that was going on, all the, uh, you know, the, the burning of buildings. Um, in fact, right here in Washington, D.C., uh, a few major uh, streets were, were basically um, completely burned up. Uh, lots of the, the business district was, uh, was gutted. Uh, and there was like National Guard in the streets and all of that. It was kind of interesting times. Of course, I come from a country where that was like normal. Uh, people, people do this quite frequently <clears throat> there. And, um, you know, they, the only thing that I could think of is, oh, there's no school tomorrow. So this, is, this, was, <laughs> this was great, a little break. Uh, but but this, this lasted for a while. And there was, uh, like I said, the National Guard was, was in the street. And... Uh, I was very fortunate um, a few years later when I was in middle school, I had a teacher who taught us the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and I had no idea what the Harlem Renaissance is or what it meant, but the Harlem Renaissance briefly is basically a, um, about 10 to 15 years of American history in the early 1900s uh, that had more art, more music, more culture, more, more of everything. More books were written, more poetry was, was written than any other uh, 10 or 15 year period in entire American history. Uh, and it was a, a, a um, resurgence of uh, a black intellect, a black philosophy that took place uh, largely here in Washington, D.C. because of Howard University and its proximity uh, to, to the U Street Corridor, which was considered um, a, a black hub uh, here in Washington, D.C. And, uh, you know, the Harlem Renaissance, of course, is named after Harlem in New York but really took its foothold here in Washington, D.C., and then moved up to New York. In fact, the Howard Theater was opened here about five years before the Apollo Theater, which uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of and know. So I, I, I knew Washington uh, in that sense. I knew the history of the city. I knew what the city was about. Um, this city was called Chocolate City for many years uh, because of the, uh, the Black presence here in, in, in the city. It is a power uh, hub for for, for black power. It is a, a place where there's a lot of black politicians and, and government is, um, is basically um, was seen as a, as a stepping stone for many uh, black people here in the, uh, toward the middle class and upper middle class, in fact. Um, so, so Washington DC was a very important uh, area for, for black culture, black intellect, black politics, black power. Uh, this city has, has gone through lots of changes. Of course, after the riots of 1968, uh, lots of white people moved out. Um, and uh, even some of the black people, many of the black people that could afford it moved out. So the city became blighted. Um, areas where my, one of my, uh, my first restaurant opened here at 14th and uh, V Street Northwest um, was, was basically an open drug market. Uh, there were, you know, you, you would come any morning and find it littered with, with, um, with syringes and condoms and all kinds of things there. And, um, and now it's uh, probably one of the most expensive areas to live in town. Um, 14th Street, uh, of course, was considered the red district. And that was like where all the hookers hung out and all the drug addicts and all that. And um, that street has changed quite dramatically and gentrified in a very, very uh, rapid way. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, that street went from the the red district where people wouldn't even dare go there uh, on 14th street after dark to being now the uh, most expensive real estate in Washington DC for restaurants and for um, for businesses um, so that it, it has gone through lots and lots of changes I, I knew that at one point this was back in 2003 2004 uh, where some of the change was taking place uh, wasn't quite there yet. Uh, and I knew that the, a lot of the changes that was taking place was really erasing a lot of the history of the city. People were moving into the city because Washington had been underrated for so many years and people were just discovering it. It's the capital of the United States, it's a big deal. Um, and uh, people have started to, were starting to move here 
and kind of try to create the city in their own image. Because it really, for many people that live outside of DC, they see DC as the, as, as the federal government, as the hub for the, they, they know the monuments, they know the Smithsonian, they know the Capitol and the White House, but they really know very little about the DC's culture and what's behind the scenes. And as these people were, were moving in, they were trying to establish it kind of in their own image. So they would come from Arizona or come from California or come from Utah or come from wherever they come. And, and then they sort of plant their flag and this is that the, it becomes their city. A lot of the people that were here prior to that were feeling a little bit of a push. This is uh, that, that the, uh, a lot of the culture was getting erased. A lot of changes were happening. Buildings were going up very rapidly and places were being opened left and right that you know, people weren't even familiar with or comfortable to even enter. So I, was, uh, I, I wanted to, to find a place that I can actually have it be representative of the city, representative of its culture, its uh, politics, its uh, intellect, all of these things. Um, so as I'm driving around, I'm, I'm actually looking for, for spaces. I knew that I wanted to be around the U Street corridor because like I mentioned earlier, that was the epicenter of the civil rights movement. I wanted a place that really kind of ties TC together. And there's no other area in DC uh, that represents that more than that particular area. So as I'm driving around, I'm seeing new buildings are going up and uh, many of them had iconic names and uh, names of, of uh, a lot of black artists, black musicians and so on uh, that were here during the Harlem Renaissance, for example, a building was going up that was named the Ellington, named after Duke Ellington, the, 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 the great musician composer. Um, and I, I guessed that many people that were in that building had no idea what Ellington is. They may have thought it's the name of the developer. They may have thought it was the name of the, you know, the daughter or the son of the developer or whatever. Um, anyway, um, it, it, my, my fear was really kind of reinforced when I looked and saw at the, at the base of the building, it's an apartment building, uh, a very high-end apartment building. At the base of the building, they had retail. And one of the retail stores was a tanning salon. And so when you see a tanning salon, um, usually that represents a, a very specific kind of demographic. Um, and and the, uh, the irony of it all is, is, is like it's multifaceted. It's in a building called the Ellington named after a black composer. It's in an area that was called Black Broadway. It's on a street that was like the, the, uh, the epicenter of the civil rights movement where it started. Uh, all of these things coming together and suddenly you have this tanning salon on the base of that building was really kind of a, um, a, 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 kind of a, a moment that I had to really, I had to do a double take to be able to stop and think like, what are they thinking and why is this happening? And how fast is it going to be erased? How fast is the history of this city going to be erased? When I saw that, my worst fears, of course, were realized. Uh, there was a building around the corner that was called uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Langston Lofts. And that I ended up looking at the Langston Lofts and I wanted to make sure that the Langston Lofts was gonna be preserved with something that has to do with Langston Hughes, the great uh, poet of the Harlem Renaissance. So I started looking and researching uh, that building and found the owner and decided to put my first restaurant in there and named it Busboys and Poets. Uh, Busboys and Poets is named after Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes was, of course, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the kind of um, quintessential poet of the Harlem Renaissance and really uh, probably one of the most prominent American poets uh, in entire uh, US history. Um, and Langston Hughes had um, lived here in, in, in Washington in the 1920s and he worked as a busboy uh, at the Wardman Park Hotel, which is a hotel that still exists here in Washington. He happened to um, notice one night that he was working there. Of course, it, you know, this country was, uh, was segregated. A black person couldn't dine in the place they were working in. And so he, uh, as, anyway, working as a, as a busser, he, um, one night there was a very famous poet by the name Vacha Lindsay walked into the restaurant and uh, he, the young Langston Hughes, at that time he was about 22 years old, slipped some of his poetry next to Vacha Lindsay's plate, hoping that Vacha Lindsay would recognize him. Uh, Vacha Lindsay looked at the poetry and nodded approvingly. Uh, the next day on his way to work, Langston Hughes picks up the newspaper and on it is said that, um, uh, there's a headline that says that Vacha Lindsay had discovered a busboy poet. 
And so that was kind of the, uh, the moment that launched uh, Langston Hughes's history, uh, I mean, uh, a career. And uh, he, he went on to be, you know, obviously even a bigger poet than he was and uh, end up making a living out of his poetry, which was a very rare thing to do, um, even, you know, of course now and even then. Um, anyway, so I, I, I wanted to create a space that really represented Washington, that spoke to Washington, that spoke to the culture of DC, which is multifaceted, as I mentioned. It's a cultural city, uh, a black cultural city. It's, a, um, it's a, a literary city. We have a lot of people that read here in Washington, DC. Uh, we have more universities here than we have high schools. Uh, we have um, lots of uh, uh, poetry. It's become one of the major poetry hubs in the country. It's a very artistic city. There's a lot of artists and people that make this city their home. Uh, so it has many, many different iterations. And I wanted a place that has all these layers fitting in there. But I was afraid that it would be not you know, not quite representative. And I, 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 I certainly didn't want to go into the cultural appropriation uh, you know, realm of things. So I wanted to make sure that it really honored the culture in a way that was more than just a name on a billboard and a couple of photographs on the wall. So I did a mural, I'm an artist myself, so I did a mural in the place and, and the mural was of the civil rights movement and spoke about the history of that area. Uh, because I wanted people when they come in to ask questions and recognize that this area had a history before they got here. And um, so I, uh, I put this, uh, this mural it has many different iconic figures and, and time periods in American history and the civil rights movement. And, um, and I, of course, you know, waiting for, for permitting is always a lengthy process. So I'm always waiting there and giving people tours every now and then when they walk by. But there were a couple of elderly black women that walked in and they uh, were, were kind of peering through the window and I decided to invite them in to take a look. And, um, and they walked in and they looked around and they didn't know how to make it out because they had lived there for all this time. They're seeing all the changes that are happening, clearly not super happy about some of the changes that were taking place, but they had a kind of a, a semi smile on, on, uh, on their face because the place represented so many things that they felt comfortable uh, you know, seeing. And when I opened up the door and showed them the mural, one of them actually had a tear come down her eye uh, because it was a place that felt like home for her. It felt like it was not erasing the history. It was really honoring it and uplifting it. So we started out with this space really with, a, with a, uh, an idea that was a place that was going to be representative of DC, a place that I wanted people to walk in and say, this is so DC. Uh, I know that people walk into many, many cities, iconic cities like New York, or uh, New Orleans or Chicago or LA. And people say, this is so LA, this is so Chicago, this is so uh, New York. I'm so sick and tired of hearing you said this is so New York. But, but, it's, but, it's, uh, but having something be so DC was something that you didn't hear. Uh, usually that's a, a negative thing uh, you know, in many ways. So I wanted a place that really represented DC in a real uh, uh, kind of neighborhoody way. And um, so I, I, I had all these things we, we decided to, to, to name it, of course, Busboys and Poets, and create a place where we felt that racial and cultural connections can actually be uh, uplifted consciously. You know, we, it was a conscious effort to make that happen. We wanted a place where art and culture and politics come together and, and uh, create a, uh, an intentional collision. And we wanted a place where people can come in and hang out. People can actually experience one another intersect with each other, break bread together, uh, and take a deliberate pause uh, to feed their mind, to feed their body, to beat their soul. Uh, and we felt like by creating places like this, you can actually begin to transform a community you're in, transform um, uh, a city, transform your neighborhood. So that was kind of the essence and the impetus behind Busboys and Poets. When, when I opened it, of course, I was there pretty much 24 seven. And the idea of the cultural and racial connections was really significant and important, but I was there the entire time. So as we grew and we opened up number two and number three, it was impossible for me to be at all the places at all time, of course. So we wanted to create something we call the tribal statement. And the tribal statement, I just mentioned it, a place where racial and cultural connections are consciously uplifted, a place where art, culture, and politics comes together and intentionally collides, a place to take that deliberate pause. And we made sure that there was a, uh, a, a statement that was infused in all of our training. 
And one of the, the most important parts that we do in order for us to really create that cultural and racial uplifting, because that, that was probably the most important element of what we do, is creating a place where no matter what background you are, no matter what race, what culture you are, you can come in and feel comfortable in there. And so in, in, in order for us to, to do that, I wanted to have uh, interaction with everybody that we hire. So everyone that we hire, especially everyone that, that deals with guests uh, in the front of the house, has to go through a, um, a race training that I do. And the race training is basically a three hour, three to four hour session where we sit together and we talk about current topics, current issues, race issues, uh, things that, that the experiences that people have had around race and particularly tied back to the restaurant hospitality industry. So how does, how does race impact hospitality? How does race impact the restaurant business? Uh, a few uh, years ago, um, the editor for the Washingtonian magazine, uh, the food editor, uh, Todd Kleiman, wrote an article about coding, about, about coding in restaurants, where you walk in and there's a, a set of codes that you experience. And the codes are unwritten, but they're there. It's the art, it's the culture, it's who greets you, it's how they greet you, it's the menu, how it's written, it's the silverware, it's the china, it's the kind of ketchup used. All these things have codes and they have signals. So when people walk in and they see these codes, they recognize whether they're welcomed or whether they're being excluded. And so, you know, creating those codes in a way that represents everybody and allows people to come from different backgrounds and feel comfortable was a, was a challenge, but it was a challenge we were willing to take and make sure that we actually embraced. And so this was uh, the, uh, the challenge for us. And part of it is to have these very deep, serious conversations with our staff about race so that they can feel comfortable working there and their comfort and their relax and, and, and the way that they move about, the way they operate can translate to the guests that walk in through the door. So we make sure that we train them on issues, for instance, on how to seat people, how to greet people, how to interact with people. And we insist because a lot of um, young people, especially white young people, tend to uh, believe that uh, being colorblind is, a, is, a, is the thing to do. That in order for me to uh, be a good person, I have to pretend like I don't see your color. Well, that's ridiculous in this country because we all see color. In fact, I see a lot of white people on this call. Um, so so it's, it's a, it's, I always do head counts. Uh, you know, I always look at, at a room and, and decide what kind of um, vibe I'm gonna get uh, through the, the racial component or, or composition of, of the room. And so for us to pretend like color doesn't exist really gets us in all kinds of trouble. So that might be counterintuitive, but the examples that we give is if you have a, let's say you open up for a Saturday morning brunch, okay? And you have a, you know, a fairly sizable restaurant and the restaurant just opened up the door and all your waiters are there and you have, let's say 10 sections, section one through section 10. Section one being all the way in the back, section 10 being all the way in the front. So the first guests walk in, it's a black couple, you take them to section one. You take them all the way through an empty restaurant and seat them back in the back corner of section one. Well, that black couple is probably gonna think differently than you imagine. They're probably gonna think in terms of why are you walking me through an entire empty restaurant to seat me in the back in the corner, not knowing that's section one and that's the first seat that you seat. But uh, it could be the best seat in the house. It's the coziest. It's the most uh, secluded. It's the place where you can feel totally comfortable and totally isolated. And it's a nice place to hang out. But for the black couple, it has a different connotation uh, because it represents sitting in the back. It's representing being invisible. It's representing not being seen. It's representing all of these things that come through that historically this country had, had done, uh, you know, from the Woolworth counters on, on down. So, so the idea that if, if you were colorblind, that's what you would do. But if you're not colorblind and you recognize them as, oh, it's a black couple walking in, then you can say, where would you like to sit? And that could be the way that you do to all customers. So rather than assuming that a white couple is going to not be uncomfortable sitting there, ask everybody, where would you like to sit? Instead of taking them to where you think they should be because you're being colorblind, you're treating everybody the same. Well, 
you know, that's not how we operate. Uh, you know, everybody has a different set of, of, uh, of uh, layers of background of experiences and so on that they bring to the table when they walk through the door. We can only see what is visual and race is very visual, of course, and very obvious. And for, for, for people to pretend it doesn't exist is really detrimental for actually our industry and people that come to our restaurants are going to be comfortable doing. So we pride ourselves in being one of the most diverse places uh, in the entire uh, city. Uh, we have uh, at any given time, a whole variety of people eating there. Um, we make sure that we allow people to intersect with each other. We seed them in, in a way that really allows for a mix of people within the space. And you'd be surprised because when you ask most people, they love the idea of being in a diverse environment. They just don't know how to do it. And they don't know how it works. They don't know uh, what it takes. They don't know, uh, you know how, how it's gonna feel. But once they're in there and they see that diverse environment around them, they're really so excited uh, the, about the fact that they're able to uh, dine in a, in, a, in, a, in a space that is representative of their city. Uh, when Todd Kleiman wrote that article, he said he visited 160 restaurants in four months in the Washington area. He said only on eight occasions, he saw more than 10 black people dining. And yet the city is more than 50% black. So it tells you that, you know, where are the black people? Where are they going? Well, they're probably dining uh, at, at home. They're probably dining with friends. They're probably not feeling as comfortable going into restaurants because the last thing you wanna, you wanna do is take your family out and be humiliated, be embarrassed, be in a situation that is less than you deserve. Uh, and I think that's, that's, the, that's the essence of why people tend to stay away from these things. And I have a, I have, I have, I have a theory that a lot of, a lot of black folks, uh, especially um, th that I know, uh, they prefer to go almost to chain restaurants because chain restaurants tend to be, you know, they have rules, they have certain uh, procedures, they have certain policies where a little out of the way kind of cute restaurant, you have no idea what you're gonna encounter. You walk in, if you're a brown person or a black person, you walk in, you have no idea what you're gonna be seeing or whether you're gonna have a comfortable experience. Um, I always say like when you're traveling around town, there used to be something called the green book uh, where black people would actually know where to go to eat, where to, where to go to get gas and all of that in the 50s. But even today, even today, uh, a, a brown or black couple or family, let's say, traveling through uh, the interstate highways going from let's say from maine to to florida um there are so many cool places you can go off the beaten path to find but a lot of people prefer not to do that because once you stop at this far away out of the way place you have no idea when you're walking through that door who you're going to encounter and what kind of situation you're going to be facing whereas for white people that's what they do you go and discover and find really cool spots and talk about it to your friends and take pictures and meet the owner and get to know them and all that. Those are not luxuries that oftentimes are afforded to people that are not white in this country. Uh, I, I have a, um, a small place that we have uh, in the Shenandoah Valley, which is uh, outside of Washington, D.C., about an hour and a half. And the further I go out of Washington, D.C., the more Confederate flags I see. Uh, and, you know, I am not comfortable going out of the way with my family uh, to be able to stop in these out of the way places. Um, I'm Muslim, I'm Arab, uh, you know, I look different than everybody else that's there. And I'm not comfortable going to these places, even though I'd love to go. I'd love to try out some of the, you know, the country cooking, the, 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 the experience, talk to the owners. Now, having said that, I actually force myself to do these things just because I like challenges. So, so, uh, so one time uh, we were out, my wife and I were out and we went to this little coffee shop and we're sitting in the, in, in, in the coffee shop and the older woman, lovely older white woman was making the coffee and uh, we both asked for coffee, we're sitting at the counter. I turn around and I see the Confederate flag sitting right by the window. And I decided to challenge her on it. I said, uh, you know, that flag is really offensive. Do you really have to have it? And she said, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. This is my culture. This is our culture. This is all of that. And I said, well, your culture is, is really um, not one that one should be very proud of. 
uh, I hate to tell you, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a culture of terror. It's a culture of, of uh, exclusion. It's a culture that has created all kinds of hardships and death for so many people. So maybe it's time to think differently about it. Um, and you know, here I am telling her what to think of her culture. Um, and it was, it was a, a challenging conversation, but very respectful. Well, my, we, we left, I made sure I, I left her a great tip. Uh, when we left, when we left, I remember uh, about three or four days later, we're driving by, the flag was not there. And I thought, wow, we, <laughs> you know, engaging people does have some value. Uh, so these are, these are things that I think um, we're all learning. We're all learning how to deal with this, uh, with, with sort of recognizing that, uh, that race is really such a significant part in this country's history. We're seeing it happening today, unfolding right before us with all the protests and demonstrations that are on the street. But having been an outsider coming in this country, I recognized it firsthand. Sometimes when you're living in this country, you don't see it. You don't see the things that other people see when they come from the outside. And I recognize that race impacts every single thing that we do here. Uh, certainly it impacts restaurants. You've seen the videos and, and, uh, and, and, and pictures of the, of the sit-ins at the Woolworth counters where people were putting sugar and ketchup on people's heads. Amazing how people get so uh, worked up about dining next to someone that is different than them. I'm, I'm, I've always been like, wow, you can ignore them. I mean, like, why do you have to hurt them, you know? Uh, but it's, it's, it, it's amazing how much uh, emotion a dining out has, how important it is for people, how important it is for us as human beings, how we are really not just uh, you know, feeding people, but we are changing lives. We're really impacting people at so many levels. I had a, uh, uh, an HR director one time, and I, I, I take dining very personally, and I talk about it with such passion. And she said, Andy, we're not changing lives, okay? We're just feeding people. I said, well, that's not true. I said, everybody goes out to eat for no matter what they're having, whether they're getting a divorce, whether they're getting married, whether they're meeting a friend, whether they're signing a contract, or they're buying a house, whatever it is, they go to a restaurant oftentimes or a coffee shop. So one day, uh, this, and I'll end with this, we had a, um, on, a, on a Thanksgiving, we decided to close the restaurant and cook this incredible uh, turkey dinner. And we invited every homeless person around. So we, we connected with homeless uh, or organizations and we told them we'd be serving free food for anyone that wants to come and eat. So all these people were, were coming in. We had tons of volunteers, uh, you know, to, to kind of help and so on. And uh, there was mid-afternoon, there was this, um, you know, man, probably in his early 40s, uh, homeless guy. He walks in and he's by himself. He gets seated and we paired him up with, uh, with a woman that was a volunteer and they were sitting having a meal. They, he, he stayed for four hours, four hours dining. At the end, he walked up to me and he says, um, are you the owner? I said, yes. He said, I want to thank you uh, for this wonderful opportunity and for this lady to spend so much time with me. He said, today I was uh, planning on committing suicide. Uh, you know, it was a, a very important day for me personally. Thanksgiving, I've lost my family. I, you know, I have all kinds of issues and so on. I've lost my family and I, I, I was tired of living. And he said, if it wasn't for you guys being open and available today, and for this lady to sit down and listen to me and talk to me, I would have killed myself uh, today. That was my plan. Um, and he said, you know, so I, so I turned around to our HR director. I see, I told you we're changing lives. We are actually saving lives. Uh, so, so the restaurant industry has so much potential uh, in how we can actually uh, change the way we interact with each other, the way we think about each other. And race, especially right now with, with all the conversations that are happening, all that stuff is such an opportunity for us to really become a leader in this area, to really become the beloved community that I think we all uh, aspire to be. So I'll stop right here. Thank and, you so uh, much, Andy. Thank you. Yeah. So any questions or comments or? Well, we're, uh, I'm gonna dovetail that into a couple of the questions that we had. Um, we're gonna save the participant Q&A for the end. Again, if you guys have any questions that come up, feel free to chat that away uh, in your Zoom chat. We've got Amanda Elder uh, keeping watch there, so we will return to those at the end. Um, but Andy, I actually wanted to go into that question you're talking about, you know, when the restaurant first opens and you can see 
somebody anywhere. Um, I, I love that idea of just asking where somebody wants to sit. You know, if you don't have reservations uh, and tables are already taken, I think that's a really great example of not assuming that people believe what you think is, is the best is, is the best. Um, I was wondering though, and I've mentioned that we have a lot of people on here that might be in retail as well, uh, working at wine and liquor stores um, all over New York City. Do you think that you could take that lesson um, and, and apply it to, to anything in retail, just in, in terms of the way we're approaching people, the way that we're not making assumptions uh, about things, because uh, retail is, is a tricky situation too, because these stores pop up in the same areas that the bars and restaurants would, you know, rapidly gentrifying, um, you know, infringing upon neighborhoods that might have had a longstanding history that the owners might not even understand really the neighborhood that they have entered into. Um, do you have any advice for retail employees? Because I know that we have a few on uh, retail store owners and, and how to best kind of harmonize with the neighborhood that they might be the newcomers to. Uh, absolutely. I think I think what we're talking about applies to any kind of industry, really, that interacts with the public. Um, you know, the, the the, the idea that um, oftentimes we are much more, we have a, a much bigger affinity to people that look like us or that speak like us or that, you know, we feel more comfortable with. And, and therefore, we're going to have a little bit of deference to those folks as opposed to others who may look different, uh, maybe older, maybe younger, maybe a, a different race, different background and so on. So, so, one, so taking the example of the host that I mentioned earlier where you see them, Another example, a host, and it could be a retail person as well, would be you have one black couple and, white, and one white couple sort of back to back waiting to be seated. And let's say you have a black hostess, all right? So the black hostess goes to the black couple and says, hey, how y'all doing? Come on in, you know? And she takes them in, she seats them. Then she goes to the white couple and she says, two, right this way. You know, so it, 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 that itself, says a lot because the white couple saw the interaction with the black couple being so warm and yet you know when she came to them it became this sort of professional cold wall that she put in front of them well that doesn't make people feel good um you know so the way you interact with 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 customers having the awareness having that constant awareness and being present and really understanding that Every nuance, every gesture, every body language, every, uh, every tone that you use is interpreted not just by the people that are standing in front of you, but anyone that's in the vicinity. They're watching. And if you act a certain way with a, a certain person uh, and you act differently with another person, that could be interpreted as being uh, you know, biased or being you know, insensitive or being any number of things. Uh, and those things are costly. You know, when, when somebody writes to me and says to me, you know, I didn't have a good experience because somebody didn't treat me right, I have to send them a gift card and I have to, you know, beg them to come back and I have to comp their food and I have to all, in order to keep them as, as, yeah. as customers. It's expensive, right? Yep. I've seen that. I've def it's funny you said that. I've, I've definitely seen that, that happen. And Yelp, you know, that... that yes, yes. Course, Please don't, don't Yelp, Yelp me. Yeah. Menu for this. But um, I, I think it is interesting because I've actually seen in retail, it works successfully, not the way you approach your customers. Um, I have a store in Prospect Leopard's Garden that I think has done an exceptional job doing the very thing you were talking about, just in terms of being aware, being present, respecting the neighborhood, and kind of just being consistent on a humanistic level. Uh, we're not gonna change up the way we approach one person versus another. Um, that also dovetailed into like the very selection that they offer. They're in a very Caribbean neighborhood, so they're offering right rums from all over the Caribbean, which I think is, is wonderful. Uh, it serves their audience and also just the greater spirits audience uh, on the whole. And they're also employing people from the neighborhood that reflect the neighborhood uh, and giving them opportunities. So I think that there are many ways that people can certainly approach that. Um, I think yeah. the best advice you can give, I, I think the best ad, 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 advice you give is don't be colorblind. Yeah. Don't be colorblind because colorblindness gets you in trouble. Uh, be aware of color, be aware of race, because we're talking about race today specifically, but be aware of race and the racial dynamics that are taking place in your neighborhood and in the, in the community in this country right now. And the, the, the more, and, and the, the key I think behind it is not just say, don't be colorblind, now go to work, is to really have a conversation about it. What does it mean not to be colorblind? Yeah. What does it mean to be aware? It's not because you're trying to, um, 
st you know, stereotype people or, or, or put them in, in, in little boxes. Uh, I mean, one, one negative uh, attribute. So uh, if I was to take the restaurant, uh, the restaurant business part of it, okay, so you see people, uh, you know, let's go back to those couple that got seated in the corner, the black couple. Now they're unhappy, right? Now the waiter walks up to them and they're giving him a really bad attitude because they're not happy with the way they were seated. They think this place is racist or this place doesn't honor them. Now the waiter has no idea what happened. Yep. All he knows is he's, he's meeting this couple for the first time and they're giving him a bad rap. Now the waiter is thinking, God, black people always angry. Now he's going to go back and try to give them kind of less than perfect service. Yep. Now they're going to be upset because they feel it and they're going to be returning food and they're going to be complaining about stuff and so on. At the end, they may even tip him badly. Yep. And so now he's going to back to his friends and saying black people tip badly. So it's all of those things start to snowball into something that is just awful. And then yep. they're going to, and then they're going to be a bad Yelp review on top of that. So, you know, I'm sure we've all seen that, that happen too. And, and the bottom line is we don't know the history. We don't know yes. what they might've just dealt with exactly. we don't know what exactly. they've been dealing with for 30 years. So I think exactly. that's an excellent point. Um, so I wanted to move on to my other question and this, uh, I've just been trying to engage as, as best as I can with this Black Lives Matter movement. And I've been listening to a lot of the writer Isabel Wilkerson. Um, she was a writer for the Times, but she describes uh, kind of the caste system uh, as, as the overarching issue, whereas race is kind of a metric within that to, to measure this, uh, kind of the idea that there are these set boundaries uh, that harken back to the Jim Crow era. Whereas we don't have laws that discriminate against black people anymore, but we certainly have these kind of systems in place. Uh, she actually recalled the Starbucks incident uh, in Philadelphia that I mentioned before, just saying that there are these enduring attitudes uh, of white people that kind of keep black people in their place. Uh, just the idea that they can't be harassed doing very ordinary things uh, that lots of other people do, such as, you know, going to a restaurant, going to get coffee. Uh, and I, I actually do, I, I agree that it is uh, systemic. Uh, I, she's named enough examples that, that I, I believe it, you know, there's a problem behind that. So that being said, do you believe that it, that race is kind of like just a subset of this overarching framework that we have in, in America, that you're kind of born into a place? Uh, and this is kind of a two-part question. If, if you do uh, believe what Ms. Wilkerson believes in terms of that, do you think that we can tackle that by tackling race, kind of working backwards? Because um, when I think of restaurants, I think of front of house and back of house, right? I think of uh, the low wage minorities that tend to be in the back of the house, the very bus boys that you speak of, the dishwashers, the line cooks, the prep cooks, um, to the front of the house where you generally have, you know, the better paid bartenders, servers. And again, this is a larger labor issue, but I kind of see that as a caste system in and of itself. And, and you're totally free to disagree. And I could be completely wrong on that. But to me, that was just kind of a microcosm of that, that bigger overarching theme of just people are kind of born into this place. And there are certainly exceptions and you can certainly work your way out of it. But I'm wondering if you see caste as, as kind of a, a problem as well, and if we can address caste by addressing race. Yeah, I mean, the, the restaurant business did not create the caste system in this country. So there are, there are many, many different uh, uh, types of businesses that people go into that, that has people at the bottom and people at the top. And usually uh, it's, it's, it's race, there's a race divide there. Um, it's, it's um, I mean, I think, I think the hospitality industry and the restaurant industry is uniquely situated in a way that actually allows people an entry level and very, very rapid growth to a much higher level uh, than they would normally have in a, in, a, in, a, in a typical kind of industry. So we've had waiters that come in uh, that within a year get promoted to management and can be making pretty decent money, uh, making 60, 70, $80,000 a year. Uh, you know, and this is the, these are people that may not even have uh, a college education or barely a high school education, maybe not even a high school education but they're hardworking, they're smart, they care that all that, all the elements that I think we all look for, for a good solid employee. So there's, I think, I think the restaurant industry has an opportunity to be the, um, the bridge that, that actually helps society to heal, helps. I've always seen, you know, in many cultures, breaking bread is a, is, a, is a spiritual experience that people come together from different opposing sides, right? They sit together, they break bread together, and they make peace with one another. And so uh, 
you know, I, when you're sitting in a restaurant, you're eating, you're focused on the food, all the blood is out of your head into your system, into your, into your stomach. You're not thinking too hard. You're just having an enjoyment, an enjoyable experience. And I think that opens up a lot of liminal spaces and opportunities for one to start shifting the way they think uh, by interacting with different people. We have, for instance, we have programs, we have poetry, we have all these things. And sometimes you have people that just by accident come into the, one of those events or one of those programs and they walk away. You can see a transformation on their face about culture, about the experience that they just had. I, I think that um, the restaurant industry is changing. I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, we, we, as you said, we're, we're a high touch uh, industry. Uh, we touch so many elements, whether it's environmental stuff, the restaurant industry is very much on top of that. Food, food sourcing, huge thing. Everybody eats, very, very important. Labor issues, very, very important. Uh, you know, spaces, leasing, all these things. Restaurants are, represent so many different layers uh, that I feel like if you can get the restaurants right, pretty much everything else will fall in place. Uh, so I feel like there's so much going on that we have to touch and be involved in. And I think we can have an impact on how uh, we move forward, not only uh, on, on, on the levels of race, but, but so many other issues, I think, uh, that our society uh, has been uh, grappling with. I, I love that. I, I totally agree. I've, I've always seen the restaurant industry as being able to be transformative. So I, I, that gives me hope, and I, yeah. I love hearing that. Yeah. Um, so my last question uh, for me, and then we're going to go to the social media, um, what would you say to those who believe they don't owe anything to the anti-discrimination movement? Uh, there's certainly a lot of people, and I, I don't blame them um, because they're limited to their experience, but they say, you know, my parents were immigrants. Uh, I'm not responsible for racism. My parents never owned slaves. My family ever, never owned slaves. Wh why am I responsible for this? Do you, do you have any advice that you might give them to, to engage them in the conversation and in the work? Sure. I would, I would, I would first of all, uh, encourage them to read the 1619 Project, uh, an epic project that was written in the New York Times by Nicole Hannah-Jones, whom uh, I recently had an interview with uh, just a few days ago. I urge you to go to our, uh, to our Facebook uh, and, and look it up and hear the interview. Um, it's at Busboys and Poets uh, on, on our Facebook. But, um, you know, it's interesting because a lot of times, you know, I'm an immigrant too. And, uh, you know, I, I came to this country and uh, in, in the late 60s. Um, but, you know, it's, when, when people say, I'm not responsible for what happened, but yet they want to take all the benefits that they come in for, right? So you may have not been responsible for slavery. Uh, you were not here. You didn't have any people on the, on the Mayflower. You weren't involved in that. That's fine. But you weren't here when the Constitution was written either. You weren't here when, when, uh, when all these uh, civil rights uh, you know, actions were actually taking place. But yet you're benefiting from them. So it's not enough to just say, I'm not responsible for all the bad stuff, but I want all the good stuff. Uh, you know, so part of it is our, we have to be grateful for, especially for, uh, for black folks here in this country, because they are truly the founding fathers of this country. They're the ones, I mean, I'm always amazed. I'm always amazed at how black folks are the most hopeful uh, the most, uh, um, they, they believe in the impossible. I mean, Im imagine when, when, when Lincoln was, was in the middle of, of, of the Civil War, he, had, he convened a group of black leaders and he said, you know what, we're not compatible. Racially, we're not compatible. I mean, I know Lincoln is the great emancipator and all that stuff, but he really didn't care for black people per se. He saw them as incompatible, right? And he said, you know, why don't you guys move out, like go back to Africa, we'll, 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 we'll ship you back out. And they said, no, we refuse to do that. Now, you would think that's an offer that no one should refuse being in the situation that black people were in, but yet they believed in this country enough to say that we're not leaving. We helped build this country and we're gonna make sure we hold it to its values, that all people are created equal. You guys wrote that shit, right? So now own up to it, right? That what, do you really mean it? Or is it just a bunch of shit on a piece of paper, right? If you really mean it, let's get to it. Let's get to there. 
So Langston Hughes, for instance, who was the great poet, right? He lived in the 1920s and 30s. He couldn't even eat in the restaurant he worked in. It was horrible for a black person to live in this country, right? A black male living in this country. And yet he wrote an epic poem called Let America Be America Again. Uh, that, that poem, like, it always blows my mind because it's one of the most hopeful poems that you could possibly read. Agreed. Now, where did that come from, right? He said, let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plane, seeking a home where he himself is free. America, you know, blah, blah, blah. All this America stuff is like, wow, this guy really had hope for this country and was holding it to its values. Black people hold this country to its values. They use the legal system. They use its, the Constitution. They use all these things to make sure that it moves. It was black people that created the, that brought about, of course, the 14th Amendment, which is, uh, equal protection under the law. That same amendment was used to bring out gay marriage. So, so people that are getting married who are of same sex are grateful to the efforts of black people to get the 14th amendment in there so that they can allow others to benefit from it. So we all benefit from all of these things. So it's not enough to say I wasn't, you know, part of the bad stuff. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Thank you. That's one of my favorite poems, too. I actually put that on my Facebook like a month ago. Oh, Just, cool. It brings tears to my eyes. Uh, yes, I yeah. think it's so hopeful and direct and honest. Um, all right, so we're going to go now to our social media questions. We source these uh, from the Skernick Instagram page. Uh, we've got three. Um, the first, I, I really, uh, something I've thought about a lot, and I'm interested, actually, in, in your engagement in this. Um, so the prison industrial system sets so many black men back professionally when they go to prison for minor drug offenses, and they struggle to find work upon their release. Have you ever intentionally hired ex-convicts? And I'm going to ask, and if so, how, is, how has that worked out for you? And is there a way to, to seek out people uh, seeking rehabilitation? We were at the forefront of, uh, of, of, of something called Ban the Box, which I'm sure many states have, uh, where we, we actually uh, do not have a checkoff uh, on an application that says, have you been a felon? Have you been convicted of a crime? Uh, many applications have that. And I, I, I don't know if it's still legal. I, I imagine it's legal in many states. But we decided to uh, work very hard and lobby against it here in Washington, D.C. So now it's illegal to ask somebody for that. Now, having said that, once you hire them, you have the right to actually do the research. And if you find them to be unworthy uh, because of their uh, crime, then you can actually not give them the job. So it's sort of it's, it's kind of a, a catch-22 in a way. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a great thing. We don't ask and we don't uh, question. We don't do background checks on people when they come to work for us. Uh, now, you know, um, back in uh, the last year of the Obama administration in 2016, uh, President Obama actually came to Busboys and Poets with a group of people that he had just uh, had, had given amnesty to, people that had low drug offenses that were, you know, sitting in prison for I don't know how many years. But he brought a whole bunch of people, brought about maybe six or seven uh, people that they had just released, um, and they brought them busboys and poets and they sat at a big table and they all ate together, broke bread together. So that was really, really cool. Um, that was the highlights of one of the highlights of my career. Uh, but anyway, it was, it was um, we, we hire many uh, people that have had uh, some sort of record. Uh, we feel that if somebody has done their, uh, their time, they deserve the opportunity to go back out in society and function. Uh, because what is the point? Okay, so you made them do their time. Now you want to bring them out and not give them a job so then go back to prison? That makes no sense whatsoever. If somebody's already done their time for society, they should be able to go back to some sort of normalcy and be able to function and be able to survive. So, yes. Uh, yep. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, second question. And, and this is tough. I'm, I'm not sure if you would have an answer for this uh, quite yet, but prior to COVID, the unemployment rate disproportionately affected Black Americans almost two to one. Uh, and the racial wealth gap between whites and uh, Black Indigenous people of color was the highest in 25 years. However, the COVID crisis has affected people of every color, uh, particularly in the hospitality industry. How should, unemployment, how should employment practices reckon this as it seems that everyone is suffering now and people of all backgrounds will be in need of economic opportunity? I know that's a huge question. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think, I think all of us, all of us in this, in this industry, at least many of us, uh, people I know, 
in this industry have been really trying to struggle to try to figure out where do we go from here, right? They're trying to figure out, people are trying to figure out, you know, is it, are we ever going to go back to any kind of normal? Or is this an opportunity to really make some drastic changes that I think the industry has been crying for for so many years? Um, we are part of the, the Restaurant Opportunity Center, which has been working very, very hard to try to change policies that happen here um, uh, it, uh, around the industry. And the, the industry is, is, is strange. I mean, I, I um, have been working with organizations to try to eliminate uh, tip wages. Uh, tip wages are sub-minimum wages that tips make up the difference. I don't know of any other industry that functions like that. Like there's, I don't think there's any other industry that pays below minimum wage with the hope that somebody tipping is gonna make up the difference. And if they don't, I guess the owner has to make it up. But still, it's, it seems very archaic. It's an old, old um, uh, archaic uh, system that has to go away. Now that requires a lot because it requires customers to buy into it. It requires uh, waiters to buy. Uh, we presented it to our waiters and they said, no, 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 we love the system. Don't change it. Uh, we tell our, our customers and our customers says, no, we love having to give tips to people because that improves service. I don't know if that's true at all. I don't think, I don't think uh, service is improved because of a tip because the tip comes afterwards anyway. And most, most people right now tip anyway because they don't want to appear cheap or racist or any other thing. So they're going to tip no matter what. They may not come back to the restaurant, but they'll still tip. So I think I think it's it, you know tipping is on its way out, and I hope I hope it becomes uh, a, a thing of the past. So we are trying to really figure out uh, as we as we speak, how can we become a more efficient operation? Because we are running on razor thin margins. Everyone I, I I believe on this call is probably in the same boat. We're all running on thin margins. This COVID has not helped in any way. It came at a time when for most of us, this is the busiest time of the year where we have events and programs, all these things that we have to cancel and get rid of. All the parades, all the, uh, all the, uh, you know, the, the things in the street, the, uh, the stuff that happens that people gather and so on are out. So it's put a lot of pressure on the industry. I'm not sure that during this time, people are willing to say, oh, let's you know, increase wages and let's do this and that. But I do believe that this is a moment where this conversation can be had because when do we have a chance to turn off the switch and restart? Like that never happens, right? We're all in this boat that's moving very quickly. So if we are able to rethink things, I mean, we're really working really, really hard to rethink the way we do things. Uh, and we're making some changes and a lot of them have to do with the way we hire the way we uh, compensate, all of these things, I think have to be part of that conversation. Yeah, agreed. Um, well, thank you for all that. And for the sake of time, I'm gonna move on to the participant uh, Q&A. We've got some questions that Amanda Elder has been vetting. Uh, Amanda, if you would like to unmute whomever you choose uh, to ask their question, I uh, pass it over to you. Yeah, we've got three great questions, and we thought we would just have the um, the people that post these questions ask themselves in order, uh, you know, that they rolled in. Uh, so starting with Nicole Castro Garo, if you could unmute yourself, you should be able to do that, I think, um, and go ahead and ask your question to Andy. Hi, I just wanted to say um, first, thank you guys so much for all of your time. I also think Krista has been a super awesome moderator through all of this, so also thank you to you. Um, but Andy, my first question is going to be kind of big, I guess. But really, what do you say or how would you recommend having the conversation with so many restaurant owners? My biggest pet peeve, I think, is, well, my investors or my guests, like I'm really scared of the backlash in terms of pivoting your restaurant ideology to being inclusive of political conversations. Uh, and there, you know, often the rebuttal is, well, most people don't think that hospitality and politics can miss can mix rather which i totally disagree with uh but they're so afraid of i think with the id poll or the cancel culture of someone coming in and being upset uh about a restaurant taking a political stance and i would love to know your thoughts on how to kind of mitigate that or how to continue pushing a conversation on restaurant owners 
Um, I am fortunate that I, I don't have any investors to answer to. So that's really been great. Uh, uh, but it's, um, I, I think, you know, any investor who has any kind of sense right now can look around and see that the world is changing. Mm -hmm. That unless, unless they're willing to make these changes along with, with it, they're gonna be left behind in the dust. Uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of it is really business focused. I mean, it, like for, for instance, here in DC, if 50% of your population is being excluded, that's 50% more business that you could have. That's, that's doubling what you already have, opportunities that are there. So a lot of times these people see them as sort of social justice kind of issues and they incompatible with business. Uh, I think they should look at them a little differently. They are a social justice issue and that's great, but they also are good business. You know, you, they're, they're a good way to um, present yourself, distinguish yourself, make sure that you are actually bringing in more people to your door, whether it's, it's customers or whether it's uh, employees. Uh, I think it just increases your pool and increases your bottom line at the end. Also, you know, uh, people, people out there now being very, very focused and very, um, uh, uh, you know, clear about what they need and what they want. And, uh, you know, lawsuits are bound to start happening. People who have not moved forward, who don't have a representative pool in their, in their workforce, who are being exclusionary, lawsuits will start coming in. And lawsuits are really, really expensive. And uh, it's so from every angle you can look at uh, is just good business. So if these investors don't come on board, try to find new ones, I don't know. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much, guys. Sure. Uh, great, okay, so next we're gonna go to our very own Erica Skernick, who I thought had a really good question. Erica, if you don't mind unmuting yourself and, and asking. Thanks, Amanda, and thank you, Andy, for being here. This was really great, really interesting. And my question was, how do we identify unconscious habits of our own? And is, are there any other examples you can share about unconscious bias in the hospitality industry, similar to the seating scenario? I just thought that was really interesting to hear. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you have to constantly be uh, questioning yourself. What, whatever you're group with, you say, would I act that way if that person was that person, uh, was, was a different person? So any kind of reaction that you might have, you kind of like switch it around and say, if that person, let's say you're a white woman, uh, you, you'd say, what if that person was a white woman? Uh, would I react the same way to them? And that's, that's one way that I check myself oftentimes, uh, you know, when I'm in that state, because all of us come with, we're all racist, uh, all of us. All of us are racist. If you grew up in America, you are racist, whether you're black, you're white or other. So I, I know that our word is really scary, especially for white people. But, but it's, a, it's an important word to understand because as Ibram Kendi was said, he said, it's not enough to just say, I'm not racist because I didn't have anything to do with this or I have a black friend or I'm a nice person or I don't see color. You have to actually be proactive in being anti-racist. You have to constantly be aware that racism exists. And in order for you to actually not be racist, is to be anti-racist, is to constantly be checking the racism that comes through. Um, now, I forgot your question. <laughs> you, you mostly answered it, but then it was just, are there any other examples similar to- it, it, Examples. There, there, are, there are really many, many examples of how we act and react. For instance, like how we name things on a menu, all right? It, it, if you're in a, in a, in a neighborhood that has a predominantly black community or predominantly Hispanic community, predominantly whatever community, you, you have to create a menu that actually isn't so out of reach. So, uh, you, know, uh, um, you know, the way you write it, the way you present it, the way you give it has to be kind of tailor made to the community that you wanna attract. Um, when we first, you know, a lot of, you know, so it's, it's no secret that in Washington DC, the highest rate of poverty is also for black people. The highest rate of, of, uh, of health issues is black people. The highest rate of bad education is black people here in the city. So we have, we have that to deal with. Um, but in order for us to make sure that we attract people of different socioeconomic backgrounds, 
we don't want to call everything this fancy, foamy, arugula, this and that. You know, we want to make sure that the food that we present is, is actually fairly easy enough. It's, people go to restaurants because they want comfort, right? And, 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 and comfort comes in many different ways. It's not just the food that you eat, but it's also being comfortable walking in, being comfortable ordering, so you don't feel like you're being excluded. So kind of, I think, I think the menu speaks a lot. I think the art uh, that you put on the walls, I think the things you put on the table, I think the way you greet people, all of these things add to that experience of, um, of creating that sort of welcoming space. And, and Andy, I've read uh, that you've mentioned specifically like putting hot sauce on the table. Like right, that right. sounds silly, but like that, that is too. And the black community is, is, a, is a thing, right? I mean, people, I, I love hot sauce. A lot of people love hot sauce. And, 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 and putting it on the table is another signal that says, you know, that I appreciate you and I appreciate you being here. And here's something else that I feel that you may enjoy. Yeah, uh, and, and another quote of yours, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I love this. Uh, you, you always have said, like, why call it a lemon beurre blanc when it's a lemon butter sauce? Like, exactly. it, might, it might be a little more accessible just the way that you- It's accessible to more people, you know, whether black or, or, or anybody else. I mean, it, you know, a lot of people don't know what beurre blanc is. I didn't until you told me that quote on that. I was like, yep, okay, now I know what beurre blanc is. Um, Amanda, are there any other questions that have popped up? Yeah, I think we've got time for one more. Um, this is uh, speaking specifically to the um, the, the wine side of uh, our participants today, which I think is great. Uh, Elise Emamura, if you could unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, hi, Andy. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I think my question kind of goes along with Erica's is as a white person in the specifically wine business, how can we be an ally and how can we be more inclusive and bring more people of color into the wine drinking atmosphere, tasting events, wine shops in predominantly black neighborhoods? Um, how, how do we even start doing that? Um, I would say partner with some black organizations. There's, there's a lot of great black organizations around, you know, uh, uh, there, there are, there are people that, you know, like even, even, or, you know, civil rights organizations, do a fundraiser with them, uh, do an event with them around wine. Uh, you know, people are more than happy to come to be at an event uh, that is, has wine at the center, but it's also helping a good cause. So there's a lot of great causes. I mean, we do a lot of events uh, in our spaces. Many of them are fundraisers. Many of them are, uh, you know, helping NGOs to find uh, new sources for, for money or exposure or whatever else that they need. Uh, yeah, and we partner with, with, with events. So events usually are a great way to attract a certain demographic uh, because an event usually is around a group or a, a, you know, a group of folks that you wanna attract. So whether it's the NAACP, whether it's the, uh, the Council of Negro Women, whether it's that a lot of organizations are, uh, have a predominantly black uh, membership that would love to be able to be asked. Uh, oftentimes they're not asked and so they don't show up. Uh, you know, you might put a flyer somewhere, but a flyer isn't going to bring somebody in uh, or an email. <laughs> it has to be, a lot of these things are really hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. You have to actually meet people and bring them in and make them the center of the conversation or the center of the event in order for them to show up, especially at the beginning when you're trying to change the culture, change your uh, the way you do business. Um, it has to be uh, intentional. Um, okay, we're going to uh, take one more question from the chat. Uh, this is coming from Alan Yadid. Uh, if you want to ask the question that you just asked, Alan. Yeah, hi, Andy. Thanks for your time today. So I, I you, you mentioned about um, job applications for the restaurants, and, and I thought that that block the box initiative is something I've read a lot about and has had some great outcomes and unintended consequences, which are really interesting to think about. Um, I wanted to know what was your opinion on asking people that are raised on job applications and given that, um, you know, my family's from a very similar part of the world to yours, how do you identify yourself and how do you feel about your, you know, racially? Cause that's something I think during all of this, I've thought a lot about. 
just wanted to hear your opinion as, as someone who's really learned it and from the same part of the world that my family is. Got it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't identify as white or black. Uh, I, I feel that that's a, that's a, uh, that's a, um, uh, a paradigm that I don't want to fall into. Uh, you know, I don't like boxes anyway, so I don't like checking off boxes. I oftentimes leave them blank. Uh, when they ask, when uh, when when they ask what race I am, I always put other, uh, just to keep people confused. Uh, you know, so that's kind of part of my thing. Uh, but I also understand. You know, I'm, I'm not making a joke about race because race is a is a, a serious business in this country, unfortunately. Uh, so I, I think it's important for people to own their identity, whatever that might be, um, and and not not diminish it. So I don't tell people don't put down anything if you don't, but if you feel like you don't want to, like we, when we have events, uh, these uh, orientations around the table, you have people that identify, you know, black people that identify as, as, as biracial. Uh, you know, there are black people that identify as black. Uh, there, are, there are people that identify as Caribbean, uh, you know, or Hispanic, who, who also may be black. So it just, it, it depends on, on you know, where, where you are, uh, you know, emotionally, mentally, uh, 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 whatever, uh, with your identity, that you decide where to go. If eventually, I mean, these, I always think that human beings uh, are not that evolved. We, we have so much to, you know, work to do to where we need to be. Uh, and all these things about identity are really, uh, is an evolutionary flaw, I think, uh, you know, that, that maybe someday before we become extinct, maybe that will, uh, you know, become less important for us. But right now it's super important. Right now it's, you know, identity is super important. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, unfortunately in this country because of the history that it's had. And it's not, you know, the thing about America that's different than about other countries when it comes to uh, race is that, first of all, this country was built by black people. So a lot of times, uh, you know, slavery started in other countries after the country is already underway, like in Britain or the Netherlands or France, so the country was already a country when they when they instilled slavery. This country was built with slavery from the get go. So that was that was a, that's a big difference. The other huge difference is Jim Crow, that idea of apartheid that happened uh, after the Civil War, after Reconstruction, until you know the early 1960s. That period of about 100 years was a devastating period psychologically for this country. And that's why I think uh, we need to be, come back to becoming more racial, more racialized, more focused on race until we can get out of that. Um, so in, in, in when you're dealing with conflict, conflict resolution, you have to go deeper, deeper, deeper first before you come up to the top. So we have to get deeper into race because we've dismissed it. We've, we've kind of said, oh, it's you know, in the past, nobody cares, blah, blah, blah. But you know, white people are fine with that, but everybody else isn't. Uh, you know, so it, it just needs to be addressed. So I, I deal with race um, head on. I always talk about it. Uh, you know, wherever I, I go, I challenge people about race. I talk about race. Um, I, I'm very open about race. I feel comfortable speaking about race. I, uh, you look a little different than me probably, but I, I had an Afro when I first came here in this country, when I had hair. Um, well, yeah, yeah, yeah you, you look like a white guy. <laughs> but but I, I looked, I looked, I looked much darker and I had an Afro. So I was called the N-word uh, and I had no idea what that meant. Uh, and you know, so all of these experiences I think shape who you are uh, as you grow up. Uh, so I, I, uh, I was shaped with that idea of, of race is, is very, very, uh, um, um, is, is an important uh, element of America. And I wanted to make sure that I knew everything about it and learned everything about it. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, I really appreciate all the time that you put into this. Um, would like to thank everybody for their questions and their participation. Uh, we are well over an hour now, so I just wanted to respect everybody's work day and their time. Um, wanted to also say as a company, we, we hope to host uh, future discussions like this. So tune into our Instagram, our Facebook page, uh, just to keep you updated on uh, further engagement. Uh, and that would be the Skernick Wines social media. 
Uh, to also further your anti-racism engagement, we had put up uh, a list of books, of podcasts, um, of articles, uh, some things that were suggested by Andy as well on our website, on our blog. So if you want to check that out, it's a great resource. Uh, and then finally, if you have further questions that didn't get answered for the sake of time, uh, feel free to go to our blog, uh, input the question into the question field, and they still will go to events. And Andy was generous enough to say that we could forward them to him uh, after the event. So hopefully, uh, if you guys have questions, feel free to lob them to us and, and we will pass them on to Andy. Uh, and we hope that everybody enjoyed their time. So thank you so much, Andy. I really appreciate it. And uh, hats off to you. Thank Please. you. Thank you. I appreciate thank it. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone have a good week. Take care. Thank you. Bye.